good morning one and all now in previous lecture we have seen mobility handover and we have seen latency two different latencies one is u plane latency and another one is c plane control plane latency and we have seen voice over internet protocol that is vo ip and we have seen self spectral efficiency and peak spectral efficiency all this we have seen in previous lecture before going into in detail into 4g right now after learning all those terminology now let us go into the uh, architecture of 4g that is now in this lecture we will see about uh, 4g lte architecture nothing but long term evolution lte stands for long term evolution now this is an advanced version of imt advanced right now 3g is advanced version is imt advanced right 3g is also called as imt 2000 now imt 2000 enhanced to imt advanced and imt advanced is enhanced to long term evolution and again long term evolution nothing but lte is advanced to lte advanced long term evolution advanced right from imt uh, we have we have gone to imt advanced from imt advanced nothing but your 4g system Uh, advanced version is LTE. From LTE again we have advanced version that is LTE advanced, right? Now in this lecture we will see the architecture of 4G LTE, right? Now we will la later we will see the specification or parameters of uh, 4G system, and after that we will see the LTE advanced requirements requirements of LTE advanced system, and at last we will see the performance characteristics of IMT advanced. LTE and LTE advanced right first we will see the architecture after that specification after that the advanced version of LTE that is nothing but LTE advanced what are its requirements we will see and later we will see we will compare the systematic performance of IMT advanced which is nothing but your 4G system and after that LTE and LTE advanced right now coming to LTE architecture now if you see this structure now the high level network architecture of lte now this lte network architecture consist of three components right one is user equipment nothing but we call it as eu or ue and another one is evolved utron what is utron umts terrestrial radio access network right already we have seen this under lecture 2 what is utran right now ut e evolved utran and evolved packet core and user equipment these are the three components that are present under the architecture of lte right the mainly the lte architecture is comprises of three com three components one is user equipment nothing but your mobile system and after that we will have evolved umts terrestrial radio access network and after that we will have evolved packet core right now we will see in detail of user equipment and that what this internally contains and what internally uh, e evolved utron contains and internal structure of evolved packet core right now this evolved packet core now this it it communicates with the outside world right if you see this structure evolved packet core is responsible for communicating with the outside world such as internet you have private corporate networks or the ip multimedia sub system now these are the uh, the third component epc epc is nothing but your evolved packet core the third component of lte architecture is responsible for communicating with packet data networks in the outside world such as it may be either internet or it may be either private corporate networks or it may be ip multimedia sub system right now this is the basic structure of lte architecture which which consists of three components one is user equipment and another one is evolved umts terrestrial radio access network which we call it as e utron and next we have third component is epc that we call it as evolved packet core right now evolved packet core the third component of lte is responsible for communicating with packet data networks in the outside world such as either it may be internet or it may be private corporate networks or it may be ip uh, ip multimedia sub system right now if you this is the basic structure you can observe here 
user equipment one component second component third component now the third component is responsible for communication with the outside world right now coming to next slide now here it has user equipment right the first component of lt architecture is nothing but your user equipment now the internal architecture of user equipment uh, for lte which is same as that of your third generation system nothing but the mobile system right now the architecture of the user equipment is same as that of 3g and 2g for this particular lte system now which is nothing but your mobile equipment right now this mobile equipment consists of three modules the mobile equipment the same is it is same for either it may be 2g system nothing but your gsm or it may be 3g system or it may be 4g the user equipment is same now the mobile equipment comprises of three modules what are those three modules first module is nothing but your mobile termination and second module is nothing but your terminal equipment and third module is nothing but your universal integrated circuit card nothing but your sim card right universal integrated circuit card nothing but your sim card now this mobile termination now this module is responsible for handling the all communication functions all the communication functions are handled by the mobile termination module now coming to terminal equipment now this terminates the data streams for terminating the data streams this module is used and next we have universal integrated circuit card nothing but your sim card right now it runs an application known as universal subscriber identity module we have a particular identity for a particular sim which we call it as usm universal subscriber identity module now this usm usim usim stores user specific data now it stores user specific data which is same as that of your 3g sim card this usm is nothing but your universal sub carrier identity module which is used to store the user specific data same as that under your third generation sim card now this keeps the information about the user's phone number home network identity and security keys etc all this data is stored under your usm usim usim which is very similar to your third generation sim card right now this is about the basic detail of uh, first component under lte nothing but your user equipment right user equipment or the mobile equipment both are same whatever the mobile that is carried under 2g the same is carried under 3g and the same is carried under 4g but with ad with some advanced features right now these are the three if you observe either it may be 2g or 3g or 4g these three uh, components will be same these three equipments will be same and if you consider 2g mobile or if you consider 3g mobile or if you consider 4g mobile or if you consider 5g existing mobile these three components these three modules should present in that particular mobile right the internal architecture of this user equipment for this particular 4g or 3g or 2g is same now it consists of three modules one is mobile termination this is responsible for handling all the communication functions and next we have terminal equipment now this is used to terminate the data streams and next we have universal integrated circuit card nothing but uicc now this is response this is responsible for uh, storing the user data now this is also nothing but your sim card right every sim card has its own identity right now that we call it as universal subscriber identity module now this usim stores the user specific data such as phone number or home network identity or security keys etc right user equipment these three modules will be present either it may be second generation system or it may be third generation system or it may be fourth generation system or it may be existing fifth generation system these three modules will be present in any mobile what is, what are those one is mobile termination responsible for handling all the communication functions and next one is terminal equipment uh, responsible for terminating the data streams and next one is universal integrated circuit card nothing but your sim card now it runs an application nothing but your universal subscriber identity module usim now this stores the user specific data such as phone number home network identity security keys etc right now this is about the first component of lte now coming to second component of lte that is evolved umts terrestrial radio access network right that is e u t a r u t r a n evolved 
UMTS, what is UMTS? Universal Mobile Telecommunication System, Evolved UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network, right? Now, if you see this architecture, this U, Evolved Utron is in between user equipment and Evolved Packet Code, right? Now, this is a medium between user equipment and Evolved pa Packet Code. Evolved U-turn is a medium between user equipment and evolved packet core. Now this U evolved U-turn handles the radio communication between the mobile and the evolved packet core. Now this is responsible for handling the communication between UE and EPC. Now this consists of a base station, right? U-turn consists of a base station. Now that is denoted by E N B, E node B which is nothing but your E node B, right? Now, if you see this structure, initially here we have U-tron, right? Now, the U-tron internal structure, it contain, contains of base station, user equipment that is connected to the U-tron, which internally contains a base station that is denoted by E node B. And again, it is connected to the evolved packet code, right? Now, this U-tron is responsible for handling the radio communication between the mobile and the EPC nothing but your evolved packet code. Now, if you see this, it has only a single base station that is that we call it as ENB or E node B, right? Now, in the next slide, we will see in detail. Now, ENB is nothing but your base station that is internally present under the U-tron. Now, this base station, the base station that is communicating with the mobile is known as your ENB, right? Now, this base station is responsible for, this base station is responsible for communicating the, between the mobile and the evolved packet core. This base station is denoted by E node B or also we call it as E N B, right? Now, this LTE mobile communicates with just one base station and one cell at a time. That means, at a time under LTE system, under LTE mobile communications, we can communicate with only one base station and one cell at a time under LTE mobile communication system we can communicate only with one base station and one cell at a time right now these are the two following functions one and two these are the two main functions that are supported by the base station nothing but your e node b or enb now the enb sends and receives the radio transmission to all the mobiles using the analog and digital signal processing functions of the LTE air interface that means the base station that is that is internally present under the U-tron is responsible for sending and receiving the radio transmission signals to all the mobiles using some processing functions right using some processing functions if you see this structure now this is your base station which is a one base station that is internally present under your evolved U-tron now this base station one function is it is responsible for transmitting and receiving the signals between the user equipment by using some processing analog and digital processing techniques right and the next we have in between enb and epc right next we have in between enb and epc that means base station controls the low level operation of all its mobiles by sending them signaling messages such as handover comment that means the base station is responsible for sending and receiving the radio transmission signals to all the mobiles. At the same time, the another function that is done by the base station is controlling the low level operation of all its mobiles, right? By sending the by sending them signaling messages such as handover comments, right? Now these are the two different main functions that are supported by the base station, which is internally present under your UTRA, right? Now under LTE mobile communication, at a time we can communicate only with one base station and one cell, right? Now the base station is responsible for sending and receiving the radio communication, radio, uh, radio signals transmissions to all the mobiles, to all the mobiles using the analog and digital signaling processing function. And what is another function it will support? It controls the low level operation of all its mobiles. One is to sending and receiving the radio transmission signals 
to all the mobile and another one is controlling the low level operation of all its mobile by sending messages so either it may be handover commands or it may be anything right it will control the low level operations by sending messages right now each enb connects with the epc what is epc evolved packet core enb is nothing but your base station under your u tron now that connects with the epc by means of s1 interface s1 interface if you see this structure see th this dotted line indicates a signal and this straight line indicates the traffic here i have represented this dotted line indicates a signals signals that are transmitting between the base station and the evolved packet core and this is the traffic between enb and epc right now this enb nothing but your base station connects with the epc by means of s1 interface and it can also be connected to nearby base stations by the x2 interface what it means is the u tron u tron internally it contains one base station now that base station will connect with the evolved packet core as under the architecture of lte now similarly it can also be connected to the nearby base station nearby base station for signaling and packet forwarding during handover right now this if you see this structure this is this is only a one base station that is present under the u tron now this base station can be connected to the nearby base station these two are the nearby base station that are connected to the uh, base station of u tron right what it means is this base station can be connected to the epc by s1 interface and this base station can be connected to the nearby base stations by using x2 interface for signaling for, for the purpose of signaling and packet forwarding during hand that means for the purpose of signaling and to transmit the data during the handover process right now this home then next we have henb henb is nothing but home enb nothing but your home base station home base station that has been purchased by a user to provide a femtocell coverage within the home right now and next we have a home home enb nothing but your home base station now this can be purchased by a user to provide the coverage within the home now that uh, that enb belongs to the that home enb belongs to the closed subscriber group and it can only be accessed by mobile with a usm and that also belong to the closed subscriber group what it means is that a user a user can buy a base station we call that base station for the purpose of coverage within the home that base station we call it as home enb home enb can be purchased by a user to provide a coverage within the home and that can be belongs to the closed subscriber group and that can only be accessed by the mobiles with a usim right what is usim we have seen here what is usim nothing but your universal subscriber identity module right only the mobiles with usim can be connected to the uh, home base station right now this is the internal architecture of utron that is evolved utron now we will see in detail now this evolved utron this handles the radio communication between the mobile and the evolved packet code right now this evolved utron has a single base station if you observe this evolved utron it has a single base station that is responsible for handling the radio communication between the mobiles nothing but your user equipment and the evolved packet code right now this base station is denoted by e node b or en b right now at a time under lte mobile communication we can communicate with only one base station and one cell at a time under lte mobile communication we can communicate only with one base station and one cell at a time right now this internal architecture of utron consists of a single base station now the two main functions that are supported by the Uh, that are supported by this base station are one is it will send it will sense and receives the radio transmissions to all the mobiles right now this the internal architecture of utron consists of a single base station now this base station sends and receives the radio transmissions to all the mobiles using analog and digital processing functions using analog and digital processing function this base station internal architecture of utron consists of a single base station now this base station sends and receives the radio transmission signals to all the mobile this is one function 
now coming to another function this base station controls the low level operations of all mobiles right this base station controls low level operations of all mobiles by sending messages by sending them signaling messages such as it may be handover commands or it may be anything what it will do it will first it will sends or receives the radio transmissions to all the mobiles and next it will controls the low level operation of all mobiles by uh, sending signaling messages right and next we have this base station now that can be connected to the evolved packet car using some interface that we that we have denoted as s1 under the structure and next it will connect with the nearby base station whatever the base station that is present under the u tron that will connect with the nearby base station with some interface now that is used for signaling and transferring the data right that is used for signaling and transferring the data in order to provide the signals and to transfer the data whatever the base station that is present under the u tron that can be interfaced with the nearby base station right now like this base stations we have one more base station that is henb home base station now this this can be purchased by a user right this can be purchased by a user in order to provide coverage within the home right if you want to if a user want to provide a coverage within the home he can buy a home enb nothing but your home base station now this belongs to a closed group closed subscriber group because it is an indoor right it is an indoor area now this belongs to the closed subscriber group and this can only be accessed by a mobiles with usim right this can only be accessed by the mobiles with the usim right like this enb we have henb nothing but your home base station responsible for providing the coverage within the home now this belongs to a closed group because since it is within the home that's why it is belongs to the closed subscriber group and this can be accessed by the mobiles only by with a usim right and next we have evolved packet core this is the core network right now if you see this this is the internal structure of your epc right here we have user equipment user equipment connected to uh, evolved utron and next evolved utron is connected to evolved packet core and next that is responsible for communicating with the outside world right now the architecture of this evolved packet core is shown here now beside there are uh, now we here we have mme and here we have hss uh, and we have pgw and sgw now besides this there are few more components which have not been shown in this particular diagram now these components like we have uh, equi equipment identity register and we have policy control and charging rules function pcrs and next we have earthquake and tsunami warning system right these are the extra components that are included in the evolved packet code but here i have not represented it right now in detail now if you see the this will give a warning system earthquake and tsunami warning system responsible for uh, giving the signals and next we have equipment identity register for identification and next we have policy control and charging rules function um, it will provide some uh, rules in order to uh, control the things right now in detail we will see in the next slide right now this evolved packet core is shown here now here here we have hss pgw sgw mme now behi behind this uh, four components we have etsw earthquake and tsunami warning system and equipment identity register and next we have policy control and charging rules function besides these four components we have three more components but those are not that much required as this four component that's why i have not represented here for warning it will give the signal earthquake and tsunami it will give generate the signal this is for identification and this is for policy control right now coming to the next slide and we here we have first component we will see about hss right evolved packet core and at the architecture we have seen it contains four components one is hss that is nothing but home subscriber server and next we have pgw that is nothing but payment packet packet data network gateway right pgw which is nothing but packet data network gateway and next we have sgw which is nothing but serving gateway packet data network gateway serving gateway and next we have mme that is nothing but mobility management entity mobility management entity right 
Now coming to the first component, we have home subscriber server, right? Now this component has been carried forward from UMTS and GSM, right? Now this component is not only present in the LTE system, this also present under your third generation system and also second generation system. Now this is a central database, home subscriber server is a central database. Now that contains uh, information about all the network operators subscribers right hss component is nothing but your is nothing but your uh, central database that contains information about all the network operators subscribers right not only in lte this component is present under third generation and gsm which contains information about all the network subscriber network subscribers right and next we have pgw P what is pgw Packet Data Network Gateway, right? PGW stands for Packet Data Network Gateway. Now, this is used for, uh, this is responsible for communicating with the outside world, right? Packet Data Network Gateway is responsible for, if you see the structure, you will understand, right? Now, this Packet PDN Gateway, right? PDN Gateway, Packet Data Network Gateway is responsible for connecting, for communicating with the outside world right for communicating with the outside world that is packet data networks we have right each packet data network is identified by an access point name and the pdn gateway has the same role as the gprs support node and the serving gprs support node with umts and gsm that means this packet data network gateway is also present under third generation system and second generation system. This packet data network gateway is responsible for communicating with the outside world, right? This packet gateway network is responsible for communicating with the outside world that is packet data network using some interface, using some interface, right? Now each packet data, we have several packet data networks that each packet data network is uh, identified by the access point name that we call it as APN. Each packet data is identified by the access point name. Now this is also present under third generation system and also under fourth generation system. And next component under evolved packet core is serving gateway. Now that stands for SDW. SDW is nothing but your serving gateway. Now this acts as a router and forwards data between the base station and PDN gateway, right? Now, if you see the structure, you will have a clear idea. Now, SGW, right? Now, this is the interface between your U-tron, which internally contains the base station and the PGW. That means, SGW acts as a router that forwards data between the base station under base station under U-tron and P PGW. Now, this is a medium between U-tron and PGW. Now, this is responsible for forwarding the data between base station under U-tron and PGW that is the operation of SGW serving gateway and next we have mobility management entity right if you see the structure here we will have an idea mobility management entity right now this controls the high level operations of the mobile by means of signaling messages and home subscriber server see low level operations of mobile are controlled by the base station under uh, U-tron and high level operations of the mobile are controlled by the MME. Either it may be low level operations or high level operation. Control is done by sending some signaling messages, right? Control is done by sending some signaling messages, right? Now, this is about the four different components under EPC. Now, behind this, we have uh, uh, EP, ETWS, nothing but earthquake tsunami warning system. Now, this is responsible for generating the uh, al alert signals and next we have equipment identity register for identification and next we have policy control and charging rules function now this is a component that is present under the evolved packet core which is not shown in the above diagram but it is responsible for po policy control decision making as well as controlling the uh, functionalities in the as well as controlling the functionalities in the policy control enforcement function which resides inside the uh, PDN gateway. What it means is that PCRS, policy control and charging rules function is a component 
which is responsible for policy control decision making as well as controlling the charging functionalities as well as controlling the charging functionality this is the operation of pcrs right now evolved packet core now this is responsible for uh, communicating with the outside world now the internal structure of evolved packet core what it contains it contains hss home subscriber server pdn gateway pgw serving gateway sdw mobile and next we have mme which is nothing but mobility management entity right mobility management entity now be behind this four uh, behind this four components we have earthquake tsunami warning system for generating uh, uh, for generating uh, alert signals and next we have equipment identity register and next we have policy control and charging rules function now behind these four components these are the three extra components that are included in the epc now hss coming to the home subscriber server this is also present under second generation system and also third generation system now this home subscriber server is a central database that contains information about all the network uh, subscribers what all the network operator subscribers information is present under hss home subscriber server now coming to packet data network gateway now this is responsible for communicating with the outside world right if you see the structure you will understand now this packet gateway is responsible for here you can store hss under hss you can store it will it is a central database that gives the information about all the network uh, operators now pgw this is responsible for communicating with the outside world right you have several packet data each packet data network is given uh, it's given it's uh, is identified by using uh, access point name that is nothing but your api right and the serving gateway that is a medium between your utron and um, pgw now this acts as a router in order to this acts as a router in order to forward the data between the base station under utron and um, pdn gateway and next we have mme mobility management entity now this controls the high level operations of a mobile by sending by by means of a signaling messages and next policy control charging rules function now this is not shown in the diagram now this is responsible for policy control decision making as well as controlling the charging functionality right now this is the internal structure of evolved packet core now coming to next slide now here we'll see the what are the functions that are done by the utron and evolved packet core right what are the functions that are done by the utron and the evolved packet core now here utron evolved utron right umts terrestrial radio access network now this is this contains internally contains a one base station that is nothing but your e node b now these are the functions that are done by this particular base station under utron what are those dynamic resource allocation and enb measurement configuration and provision uh, radio admission control connection mobility control rb control and intercell rhythm right now these are the functions that are done by the base station under uh, utron now coming to epc under epc we have home subscriber home sub subscriber server and next we have mme and next we have sdw serving gateway pdn gateway right now under hss it will store the uh, information about all the network subscribers now coming to the mme now th the function of this mme is to provide nas security and idle state mobility handling and eps bearer controller and uh, sgw now this is a medium between pdn pgw pdn gateway and uh, utron now this is used to forward the data between utron and pgw and it also provides mobility anchoring now pgw packet filtering and uh, user equipment ip address allocation these are the two functions that are done by the pdn gateway right these are the functionality split between what are the functions that are done by the mme and what are the functions that are done by the uh, serving gateway and pdn gateway is represented on the right side on the left side we have represented the functions that are done by the base station under the utron evolved utron right and in the next slide we will see the parameters of 4g right in the next slide we will see the parameters of 4g now coming to the first parameter here we have frequency range right now the frequency range of 4g 
is of UMTS, FDD bands and TDD bands. We have a table, right? Under that table, you will have a TDD bands table and FDD bands table, which contains a frequency ranges, right? Starting, it starts about 700 to 1700 under FDD and TDD ends with around 2000 megahertz, right? Frequency range is in the terms of megahertz. If you observe that table, you will have a clear idea, right? Now, the frequency range of 4G is, uh, it, it contains UMTS, uh, Universal Mobile Tele, uh, Terrestrial, Universal Mobile Telecommunication System, right? UMTS is nothing but Universal Mobile Telecommunication System, Systems FDD Bands, right? and TDD bands. Now coming to the duplexing parameter, now this 4G supports um, frequency division duplex, time division duplex and half duplex FDD, right. Now this 4G supports turbo code channel coding, right and it has a mobility of 350 kilometers per hour, right, 350 kilometers per hour is the mobility of 4G system and it has a different channel bandwidth, scalable bandwidth, we have seen a parameter called scalable bandwidth according to the requirement it should get adjusted to the low bandwidth as well as high bandwidth now starting from 1 mega hedges to 20 mega hedges this is the scalable bandwidth of fourth generation system right now coming to the transmission bandwidth now this starts from 6 to 100 transmission bandwidth configuration starts from 6 to 100 and next modulation schemes coming to the next parameter modulation scheme under the uplink the modulation scheme that is supported by the 4G system is QPSK quadrature phase shift keying or uh, 16 QAM or 64 QAM. 64 QAM is optional but most probably we, we will use 16 QAM. Under the downlink modulation scheme preferred is QPSK 16 QAM and also 64 QAM. Right? Now the frequency range you will have a uh, UMTS FDD bands and TDD bands. Under FDD bands, it will start around 700, ends with 1700. Under TDD bands, it will end with around 2000 megahertz. Those are the frequency ranges that are supported by the fourth generation system. Now, this fourth generation system supports frequency division duplex, time division duplex, and half duplex FDD. And channel coding uh, that is used by the fourth generation system is Turbo Code. Now, it has a mobility of uh, up to 350 kilometers per hour and the scalable bandwidth is 1 mega hedges to 20 mega hedges, right? According to the requirement, uh, it should be able to access low bandwidth as well as high bandwidth that we call it as scalable bandwidth, varying from 1 mega hedges to 20 mega hedges and the transmission bandwidth configuration is 6 to 100 and 6 to 100 and, and next we have modulation schemes under uplink uh, the modulation scheme supported is QPSK 16 QAM and 64 QAM which is optional under downlink uh, the same modulation schemes are supported and coming to next parameter multiple access schemes right under uplink SCFDMA nothing but your single carrier frequency division multiple access now that supports 50 Mbps 50 megabits per second these are the multiple access schemes under uplink SCFDMA is supported under downlink OFDMA is supported now it has a data rate of 50 mbps under uplink and 100 mbps under downlink for 20 megahertz spectrum right now coming to the multi antenna technology parameter under uplink multi user MIMO is used and under, under uh, downlink transmit antenna array which is nothing but TXAA transmit antenna array Spatial multiplexing and next we have cyclic delay diversity, CDD, cyclic delay diversity. Now this is nothing but a form of transmit diversity, CDD it is a form of transmit diversity where a different phase shift, where a different phase shift is applied to each OFDM carrier, CDD it is a form of transmit diversity where a different phase shift is applied to each OFDM sub carrier, right. Now, these are the different uh, multiple antenna technologies that are supported in the downlink. Under uplink, we will use multi-user MIMO under downlink transmit antenna array and spatial multiplexing and cyclic delay diversity. These are the three different multiple antenna technologies that are supported in the downlink of 4G system. And next, coming to peak data rate. Under uplink, 
75 megabits per second data rate is supported under downlink depending on the variations of uh, MIMO right for 2 by 2 MIMO we will have 150 Mbps data rate and for 4 by 4 MIMO we will have 300 Mbps data rate right and the maximum preferred one is 4 by 4 MIMO only right and for coming to next parameter MIMO and the, under the uplink 1 by 2 and 1 by 4 is preferred and under the downlink 2 by 2 4 by 2 and 4 by 4 is preferred right for a transmit antennas and for receiving antennas now coming to the coverage 5 to 100 kilometers uh, with slight degradation after 30 kilometers that means the fourth generation system can provide coverage up to 100 kilometers right and next we have quality of service it will provide e to e quality of service and next we have latency and it provides a latency which is less than 10 milliseconds right now multiple access schemes under the uplink it will support sub carrier fdma under downlink it supports ofda multiple antenna technology parameter under uplink it will support multi user memo under downlink it supports transmit uh, antenna array cdd that is nothing but cyclic delay diversity um, and next we have spatial multiplexing these are the multiple antenna technologies that are supported in the downlink under the 4g system now coming to the peak data rate under uplink we have it will provide the data rate of 75 megabits per second and under downlink it will provide the data rate of 150 mbps if you are using 2 by 2 memo if you are using 4 by 4 memo in the downlink it will provide the data rate of 300 mbps now coming to memo system under uplink it will support 1 by 2 memo or 1 by 4 memo and under the downlink it will support 2 by 2 memo 4 by 2 memo and 4 by 4 memo and it will provide the coverage up to 100 kilometers under up to 100 kilometers the 4g system can provide the coverage and it will provide e to e quality of services different quality of services and it has a low latency end, end, end user latency that is less than 10 millisecond these are the different parameters of a 4g system we have frequency range that is fdd bands and tdd bands and next we have duplexing which supports tdd fdd and half duplex fdd now it supports turbo code channel coding and it has a mobility of 350 km per hour and it has a scalable bandwidth varying from 1 megahertz to 20 megahertz and it, uh, it has a transmission bandwidth configuration of varying from 6 to 100 and it has a modulation scheme supported under uplink or qpsk 16 qam 64 qam which is optional and under the downlink the same modulation schemes can be used that is qpsk 16 qam and 64 qam and next coming to multiple access scheme under uplink sub carrier fdma and under the downlink ofdma and coming to multiple technology multi user memo under uplink and tra transmit antenna array spatial multiplexing and cdd under downlink now coming to data rate under uplink it will provide the data rate of 75 mbps and under the downlink for 2 by 2 memo it will provide the data rate of 150 mbps and for 4 by 4 memo it will provide the data rate of 300 mbps now 1 by 2 1 by 4 memos are supported in the uplink under the fourth generation system and 2 by 2 4 by 4 4 by 2 are the uh, three different memo types that are supported in the fourth generation system and next it will provide the coverage of up to 100 kilometers and it will provide the e to e quality services quality of services and next it has a latency of less than 10 millisecond now these are the different parameters of fourth generation system now coming to next advanced version of lte that is nothing but lte advanced now what are the requirements of lte advanced we will see in this uh, slide right now the lte advanced is a mobile communication standard and it, which is the enhancement of long term evolution standard what it means is that lte advanced is an enhancement of long term evolution right now these are the some requirements of lte advanced we will see one by one now the cell spectral efficiency what is cell spectral efficiency we have seen we have seen under lecture 3 now the cell spectral efficiency ranging from 3 bits per hertz per cell in the indoor downlink scenario to 0 0.7 bits per hertz per cell in the high speed uplink scenario that means the first requirement of lte advanced is it has to provide the cell spectral efficiency of 3 bits per hertz per cell in the downlink scenario and 0 0.7 bits per hertz per cell in the uplink scenario 
these are the two requirements in the downlink and the uplink of self vector efficiency now coming to the next requirement now it has to uh, provide the peak spectral efficiency ranging up to 15 bits per second per hertz the peak spectral efficiency requirement is up to 15 bits per second per hertz under lte advance now the bandwidth scalability up to and including 40 megahertz up to 100 megahertz should also be that means minimum it has to provide the scalable bandwidth of 40 megahertz and up to 100 megahertz scalable bandwidth should be in between 40 to 100 megahertz for the lte advanced system now coming to cell edge user spectral efficiency now this has to provide lte advanced system has to provide the cell edge user spectral efficiency ranging from 0.015 bits per seconds per hertz to 0.1 bits per seconds per hertz now coming to latency requirements now for control plane to achieve 100 ms that is millisecond transition time in order to switch from ideal state to active state and user plane latency should be 10 milliseconds right control plane latency requirement is 100 milliseconds less than less than or equals to 100 millisecond and uh, user plane latency should be 10 milliseconds and the mobility mobility it should support up to 350 kilometers per hour now coming to handover interruption time Uh, this is this is to 27.5 millisecond and for intra frequency 40 and 60 milliseconds and for uh, and for the inter frequency within the band and the band between the bands respective that means for the handover interruption time it has to provide 27 uh, for the, for 27.5 milliseconds for intra frequency band and for inter frequency band under within the band and uh, between the bands within the same band and between the different bands it has to provide the handover interruption time of this table we have seen in the previous lecture again the same thing is repeated here now coming to vivo ip capacity what is vivo ip voice over internet protocol right now the voice over internet protocol the number of users should be its capacity should be ranging from 30 to 50 users per sector per megahertz right now the it, it is a vip capacity for lte advanced requirements right now these are the some requirements of lte advanced requirement first one is a self vector efficiency of 3 bits per hertz per cell in downlink and 0.7 bits per hertz per cell in the uplink this is one requirement self vector efficiency now coming to peak spectral efficiency it should provide a peak spectral efficiency up to 15 bits per second per hertz and it should provide the scalable bandwidth varying from 40 megahertz to 100 megahertz and next it should provide a cell edge user spectral efficiency ranging from 0.015 bits per second per hertz to 0.1 bits per second per hertz and coming to latency requirements control plane latency that is in order to switch from ideal state to active state it should achieve 100 millisecond and user plane latency should be 10 millisecond and it should support a mobility up to 350 km per hour and handover coming to handover interruption time for inter frequency the handover interruption time is 27.5 millisecond and for inter frequency that is within the band we have 40 millisecond and between the band the handover interruption time is 60 millisecond now coming to vivo ip capacity now this um, now vivo ip is nothing but voice over internet protocol now its capacity should be ranging from 30 to 50 users per sector per megahertz these are the requirements of lte advanced right now in the next slide we will see the differences between performances performance differences between imt advanced lte and lte advanced right now the imt now the performance metrics include peak data rate peak spectral efficiency scalable bandwidth right scalable bandwidth user plane latency c plane latency handover interruption time right handover interruption time and vivo ip capacity right now coming to peak data rate now coming to peak data rate now imt advanced under the downlink the peak data rate produced by imt advanced is 1 gigabits per second and at the, and under the uplink it provides 1 gigabits per second now coming to lte here the data rate has been decreased right 
Now downlink it will provide the 300 Mbps and for the uplink it will provide the 75 Mbps. Now this 300 Mbps is for 4 by 4 MIMO. If you consider 2 by 2 MIMO again it is uh, data rate has been shut down to half of it that is 150 Mbps. Now coming to LTE advanced. For the downlink it will provide the peak data rate of 1 Gbps and for the uplink it will provide the data rate of 0 0.5. Gbps. Now coming to peak spectral efficiency, now and for, for the downlink 15 uh, bits per second per hertz and for the uplink 6.75 bits per seconds per hertz and for the downlink and here it is 15 bits per second per hertz and uh, for the uplink the peak spectral efficiency is again decreased by half that is 3.75 bits per seconds per hertz and for the downlink under LTE advanced here we have 30 bps bits per second per hertz and for the uplink here we have 15 bits per second per hertz. Now coming to the scalable bandwidth. Scalable bandwidth for LTE system is up to 40 megahertz and for LTE advanced system the scalable bandwidth is up to 100 megahertz. Right? Now coming to uplane latency. Now under IMT advanced system the maximum uplane latency is 10 milliseconds and for LTE system it is less than 6 milliseconds and for LTE advanced system it is maximum of 10 milliseconds. Now coming to C plane latency for IMT advanced system it is maximum of uh, 100 milliseconds and for LTE it is maximum of 50 milliseconds and for LTE advanced it is maximum of 50 milliseconds. Now coming to handover interruption time. Now for intra frequency again we have two different types one is intra frequency and inter frequency. And for, uh, for IMT advanced system, for intra frequency handover interruption time is 27.5 milliseconds and for inter frequency within the band it is 40 milliseconds and for different bands it is 60 milliseconds. This table we have seen in previous lecture. The same is repeated for IMT advanced system. Now coming to LTE system, the handover interruption time it will vary from 30 to 60 milliseconds. Now for LTE advanced system, it provides better handover time than handover interruption time than LTE system. Now coming to vivo IP capacity that is voice over uh, internet protocol that is uh, voice over internet protocol capacity. Now for IMT advanced system that is 30 to 50 users per sector per megahertz. Now for LTE um, it, it will provide uh, better than IMT advanced and for LTE advanced it will provide better than uh, vivo IP capacity is better than LTE advanced system. Now these are the performance metrics uh, between 4G system, LTE system and LTE advanced system. Now the first peak data rate, um, first peak data rate metric under IMT advanced you will have under downlink you have 1 gigabits per second and for uplink you have 1 gigabits per second and for LTE system the peak data rate in downlink is 300 Mbps and peak data rate in uplink is 75 Mbps. And for LTE advanced system, the peak data rate in downlink is 1 Gbps and peak data rate in uplink is 0 0.5 Gbps. Now coming to peak spectral efficiency under IMT advanced system, in downlink it is 15 Bps per hertz and in uplink it is 6.75 Bps per hertz. And for LTE system, in downlink the peak spectral efficiency is 15 Bps per hertz and in uplink it is 3.75 Bps per hertz. And for LTE advanced system, the peak spectral efficiency is 30 Bps per hertz and in, and in uplink it is uh, 15 Bps per hertz. Now coming to the scalable bandwidth, that is uh, according to the requirement, uh, the bandwidth should be uh, varied, that is either it may be low bandwidth or a higher bandwidth. And for IMT advanced system, the minimum scalable bandwidth is 40 megahertz. and for LTE, LTE systems, the minimum scalable bandwidth is 40 megahertz. And for LTE advanced system, the scalable bandwidth is up to 100 megahertz. Now coming to latency condition, for U-plane latency, for IMT advanced system, it is 10 milliseconds. And for LTE, it is less than 6 milliseconds. And for LTE advanced, it is 10 milliseconds. And coming to control plane latency, that is switching from idle state to active state. For IMT advanced, it is 100 milliseconds. For LTE, it is 50 milliseconds. And for LTE advanced, it is 50 milliseconds. Now coming to handover interruption time, it is under for IMT advanced it is 27.5 milliseconds for intra frequency and 40 milliseconds within the band under uh, inter frequency 
and 60 milliseconds is between different bands under interfrequency. Now for LTE system it will vary from 30 to 60 milliseconds depending on the handover scenario and effective radio condition and for LTE advanced system the handover interruption time is better than LTE. Now coming to Viva IP capacity voice over internet protocol. Now the Viva IP capacity for IMT advanced is 30 to 50 users per sector per megahertz. Now for LTE it is um, it provide its capacity is better than IMT advanced and for LTE advanced Viva IP capacity is better than LTE. Now till now we have uh, we have seen basics of 2G, basics of 3G and uh, some specifications of uh, and some specifications of uh, uh, 3G and we have seen harmonization of 3G and later uh, we have seen uh, 4G some terminologies and after that we have seen LTE architecture basic parameters of uh, 4G system and next we have seen LTE advanced requirements and after that we, we, are, we have seen the performance metrics between IMT advanced LTE and LTE advanced. LTE ad now in the next lecture we will see uh, we will go into the fifth generation system we will see introduction to fifth generation system after that we will see some uh, ITUR recommendation standard recommendation and after that we will see the data rate uh, um, data rate from 1G to 5th generation we will see in the next lecture right thanks